as I said on the bus, it was a um, a, uh, a like a resort town, a beach, swimming beach, and stuff like that, um, and sold to the Franciscan Church, being excavated by actually the Franciscans in Mexico. Um, hence, the Mexican flag is not flying today. <laughs> it often is. All right, Mexican. Um, and and a way of connecting, a way of connecting a, ch a, a a body of Christians to this land that is not North that is not North Amer uh, American, United States or European, but some of the larger world connected here in a significant property, and all of that is correct. Uh, the excavation was just under the surface. You can see the ground level here, just under the surface, like this. Uh, the site was basically covered over by water wash off of the the Wadi Valley that comes uh, below uh, Arbel and uh, the floodwaters and so on coming here and, and covering the site. Magdala, northwestern side of the lake. Uh, we have these two stories back to back in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 7, the end. Chapter 8, the beginning. The two stories are often united as if they're talking about the same person. And that's unfortunate, because it gives Mary Magdalene a bad reputation, uh, perhaps one that she does not deserve. And it fuels novelists who want to make money at checkout counter display stands, um, which is also unfortunate. Jesus said, Peter, Simon, I have something to say to you. Well, then say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarius is what a normal worker would earn in one day. So uh, pushing two years worth of work is what was owed. The other one, 50, month and a half worth of work. They were unable to repay. He forgave both of them graciously. Who do you think will love him more? You know, I'm always bothered by this question because they should both love him equally, right? But, but, um, Jesus is pointing toward, I guess, something else. Because he says, Simon said, I suppose the one he forgave more. And Jesus said, you've judged correctly, at least maybe in human standards. The, um, the one who uh, seems to receive more is the one more gracious. I'm not sure that's actually, I wonder if Jesus is driving to a bigger point. Anyway, he said to Simon, look, you see this woman, uh, she, I entered your house you gave me no water for my feet. She washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no towel. You gave me no kiss, uh, the kiss of greeting. Yeah. Since the time I came in, she's not ceased to give me the kiss, kiss of greeting, but on my feet. <coughs> you didn't anoint my head with oil. She anointed my feet with perfume. Her sins, they're many. They've been forgiven. She's shown me, she's loved much. She's shown me tremendous, what? Repentance? Repentance. Repentance, yeah. Tremendous repentance. He said your sins have been forgiven. Those who are reclining at table with him at the banquet said, what? We? He can forgive sins too? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. Your life has been restored the way it's supposed to be. Soon afterward, he began going around from city to city, village to village, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. Some women were with him too. Some who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary from Magdala. Mary the Magdalene. She had seven demons gone out of her. Joanna, the wife of Chuza, the steward of Herod. She was well positioned. <laughs> Susanna and many others contributing to their support, out of their support, out of their, contributing uh, to the support of Jesus out of their private means. Now, three things here. The first thing I think is to correct something that is read incorrectly. Because Mary Magdalene is mentioned first and because it says she had seven demons out of her and we just had the story prior to that in the previous chapter about the woman who apparently was caught in all 
kinds of sins, we assume <laughs> that lady was Mary Magdalene and that she was a prostitute, she was all kinds of other things. That makes good novels, it doesn't necessarily make good hermeneutics. I don't think we need to give her that reputation. I don't think we need to. What these demons were, I don't know. I don't know. But she is linked both to the town of Magdala, Migdal, this town, and she's linked to some pretty significant ladies as well. And it says they were contributing out of their means to help Jesus. Remember at Capernaum I said that Jesus was a tecton, he could have earned his own way? Probably did now and again. Unlike the other rabbis, <laughs> apparently he was so successful in interacting with people that he didn't have time to tecton. And so to compensate, to allow him to do so, some of his followers contributed to his means so he wouldn't have to do that. Right. Number three, these people who contributed apparently had means to give. One of them is the wife of Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, one of his high officials. One of them is Mary from Magdala. One of them is Mary from Magdala. Rather than read her as a uh, sort of rough and tumble woman of the street, uh, she seems to be a rather well off, highly skilled, connected, and I don't know if I'll say affluent, but of means, of means. Somebody who, wait, I thought only men were supposed to do that and women were supposed to stay at home. This is a counter verse to that idea, to that idea. We, we, when we look at the wide sweep of women in the first century, we find out that the stigma <coughs> that has been attached to them in certain texts of being the woman at home who doesn't know anything, who is equal to the animals, uh, may have attained in some people's opinion in the past, but not everybody. It's, it's misreading uh, all of the data. Uh, we, can, we can embrace the women of the past, yeah? We can, we can embrace the women of today as, as fully functioning within a society that is not quite as male-dominated as we sometimes want to make it out to be. These are important to people in the, in the, the biblical narrative, and we need to, we need to see that. We need to see that. Uh, Mary of Magdala. When we excavate at Magdala, we, we have something now to back that up. You know, we were just at Chorazin. We were just at Capernaum. Uh, and Chorazin, kind of a rough town up on the slope. Even Capernaum, the housing style was about the same. The stones were kind of rough and tumble, round, unfinished stones and things. When you come to Magdala, we're going to see a synagogue and houses and streets that look like they should be in Jerusalem. Very well cut in place. Tiberias, the capital of Galilee, is right over that ridge. This is the closest town to Tiberias' agricultural basin. This is the town where the fish were brought to be salted and then shipped out. It seems to be well positioned as, as let's say, the economic motor that keeps Tiberius going, and the people here participating in that, Mary of Mangala being one of them. Well positioned, right? She too believed. She too believed. Um, let me show you some things that, that we found. A right? few things that we found. We'll try to redeem Mary in our mind. Um, this is an out of C2 reproduction. Let's go over here instead. 